All right, folks. So our next speaker is Professor Aaron M. Ellison. He is the Senior Research Fellow in Ecology in Harvard's Department of Orga uh, Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, Senior Ecologist at the Harvard Forest, and a semi-professional photographer and writer. Most recently, he co-edited with Louis Adamac, Hold It Up, this amazing book. He's selling it there uh, over next door at the um, show and sell, FYI, and it's basically like the carnivorous plant textbook that we all wish existed, but didn't really. It has like systematically goes through all the different genera, and it's like, here's the periphery of phylogeny, here's the drosphora of phylogeny, and much, much more. Anyways, I super encourage you to guys to buy it. I've already got my copy, as is Peter's. That's my copy right there. Don't touch it. <laughs> I know where it is. Just autograph that to Damon, please. That's all. <laughs> it's been a great conference so far, right? Yes. I want to go to Japan again. Yeah. The next conference. Thank you, Aaron. Let's get you the mic here. In the center. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, and uh, two years ago with the ICPS at Q, I talked about some of my work with uh, Saracenia and how we use it as an indicator for tipping points in ecological systems. And I mentioned at the time that in two years at the next ICPS, this was back in 2016, that this book would be available. And in fact, it is. Um, it, it came out in February um, from Oxford University Press. And as Damon said, I've got a handful of copies left uh, in the in the sales room that I'll be selling and autographing uh, in the next hour after we're done here before sales close and get it today because I have to fly to New Orleans tonight. So, um, so it is available and we're really excited about it. It, is, uh, it was a real labor of love putting it together. And it took us about two years to really put together after we had signed the contract. In addition to Lubomir and I, who together wrote um, four chapters, we've got another 25 chapters. We've got 23 other lead authors, um, including three of whom who are here at the, at the conference uh, this weekend. And so if you get a book, you can wander around. You can find Andreas um, and, uh, and uh, Ulrika and uh, Andre and get additional signatures uh, on your book as well, which would be great. Um, it's really great representation of people from all over the world. Um, so we had authors from 18 countries on every continent except Antarctica where uh, carnivorous plants have not yet been introduced. <laughs> I was just there in December and I'm, I was looking. I, it looks like good habitat for pinguicula um, in some places, but, uh, but not much else. Um, and we've, we've had a couple of op opportunities to talk about the book and to get together in different venues. Um, last summer, uh, a number of us were at the Society for Experimental Biology meetings in, uh, in Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, and we did a symposium on carnivorous plants on Lubomir's birthday. Um, so after the, after the symposium and session, we, uh, we sent happy birthday wishes to him in the Czech Republic. And a few weeks after that, a number of others of us were at the International Botanic Congress in uh, Shenzhen, um, where we talked about these, uh, these remarkable plants as well. And what I'll be talking about today really are some of the, the key, what I think of as scientific advances uh, with carnivorous plants that have happened really in the last decade, but overall in the last 30 years, um, that we cover some of the, we cover some of these in the, in the book along with many others. But I want to really make the, make the point that, as Damon said, there really aren't a lot of texts out there that go through the 
hardcore botany, uh, physiology, ecology, developmental biology, anatomy, systematics of carnivorous plants. Darwin did the first one um, about 140 some years ago. Francis Lloyd did the second one uh, about 50 years later. Barry Juniper uh, and, and his colleagues did one in 1989, and that's the one that many of us cut our teeth on when we were learning the science of carnivorous plants. Um, it's long out of print. If you can even find a copy, uh, we're from rare book dealers. They're extraordinarily expensive. Um, and when we sat down to put together um, the most recent book, there are a couple of, of key differences between what, what the previous three um, major scientific works and ours is. The first is um, the field, the researchers and the, the fields of science being done on carnivorous plants have just exploded in the last 30 years. And so whereas Darwin could write a book about carnivorous plants all by himself with the, what he knew at the time, and Francis Lloyd could do the same thing with what he knew at the time. Um, with Juniper Robbins and Joel, it took three guys to do to cover the, the preceding the next 50 years worth of work. It was just impossible for two people or even three people or four people to do this uh, in the early 21st century. And both Lubomir and I had been approached by various publishers um, in the preceding four or five years saying, hey, would you know the world really needs another carnivorous plant book? And we both said, no, there's just no way. You know, neither of us could do it on our own. I know a little bit about Saracenia, and Lubomir knows an awful lot about Utricularia and Aldrovanda, but, and we've written papers together as well. But the field was just really vast. But we kept talking about it. Our colleagues said, oh, you know, if anyone's going to do it, you guys should do it. And we said, no, we really can't do it. But maybe we could get a lot of people together and, and really get something something going out of it. And so that's what we thought we tried to do. And we hearken back as well thinking differently about what Juniper Robbins and Joel had done in the 1980s. So they organized a symposium, the Ox Oxford Conference in 19, um, 1980 for the Society for Experimental Biology. So in that way, it was really fun to be at the SEB meetings again last year. Um, 37 years later. Um, and they put together a really good program on carnivorous plants um, of the real leading lights at the time. And, and what people were really focused on was the anatomy, the, the, the detailed um, how carnivorous plants are really digesting prey. What was the anatomy? What was the, the cellular physiology? How did we really um, how did these things really work? And most of the research at the time that had been being done on these was really being done in greenhouses and in laboratories. And by the, by the late 1980s, that was really, in a lot of ways, really pretty well worked out. And we certainly didn't want to replicate that sort of material um, in, in, the new, in the new book. And so we said, well, OK, how would we? How would we update that, and, and where would we start? And so even though the book really goes through physiology, ecology, and evolution, we really, st in, in, in the title of it, but we really start with the evolution and the systematics. Um, and we've learned an incredible amount about carnivorous plants um, and their evolution in the, last, in the last 30 or 40 years. All of us now take for granted that carnivorous plants show up all over the plant kingdom. And when Nick Gatelli and I put together this review of uh, carnivorous plants, some of the, the major open questions in carnivorous plant research for the, the um, 150th birthday of, of Darwin a few years back, At the time, so this, part, this paper was published in 2008. So 10 years ago, this paper was published. And at the time, we knew approximately 600 species of carnivorous plants, exclusive of hybrids. 
And at the time, we knew that these had arisen evolutionarily six different times across the plant kingdom. So we had, we have uh, the, the carnivorous bromeliads and the monocots. We have the caryophyll group with Drosera and Dionea, Nepenthes. Um, we have the Saracenia and Origilaclade in the Aracales, and we have the Pinguicula in the, in the uh, and Genlissia and Utricularia clade in the mints. And so was, these were all over the plant kingdom. And as I say, we take this all for granted. But when Juniper was writing in the 1980s, we didn't know this. There were this the botanists were still debating whether carnivorous plants were all related to one another in a single evolutionary lineage, which is what Darwin had thought, or whether they had arisen independently. And this was first really being debated um, around then. But as I said, 10 years ago, we had 600 species and six independent evolutionary events. But when Andreas reviewed and his colleagues reviewed what we knew about carnivorous plants in 2017, nine years later, we're up to at least 800 species. So 200 more species had been described in nine years. And now we have at least 10, and I think now 11, maybe radi independent radiations of carnivorous plants. So this is expanding incredibly rapidly. And it's simply in the last year since the book was produced, I think we've had another, I don't know what, 25, 30, 40 species of new carnivorous plants described. So just an incredible rate of new, new basic um, information coming out about, um, about the carnivorous plant, just the, the systematics and the evolution of them. We've got a pretty good understanding now of the different kinds of traps. And this hasn't changed a lot since Juniper uh, and did his book 30 years ago. We, we understand that we have flypaper traps and snap traps, suction, suction traps, and, and passive traps, some of which are a little more active than perhaps we previously expected. Um, we see consistently in, in most lineages that, that the more ancestral groups are simpler traps. They tend to be sticky traps. And the more uh, derived lineages tend to be more complex traps, either pitfall traps or eel traps or suction, suction traps, although that's not quite the case with the Saracenia lineage than Rorigula. We know that they hybridize. And we've seen examples in the talks yesterday and today about different hybrids, um, which is challenging our concepts of what it means to be a carnivorous plant species, right? And, and how we actually apply the biological species concept to things like Nepenthes and Saracenia, which have diversified very, very recently in evolutionary time. Another thing that we've learned that's been really interesting to think about is that we think about carnivorous plants and botanical carnivory evolving from non-carnivorous lineages. And Andre Pavlovic described this morning the, chain, the shift from defensive compounds and defensive chemistry to carnivory. But it also turns out that we have examples now of carnivorous lineages losing carnivorous properties. Um, and so, and this again is occurring across all the different lineages. So some of the things that we have here, um, we have Drosseras that are, that are losing their, their, their ability to trap prey. Um, we have, uh, we have Trifiophyllum, which, of course, is carnivorous as a, as a young plant and is less carnivorous as an old plant. Um, we have in the same lineage that Drosophyllum and Trifiophyllum are in, we have Ancestor Cladus, which is even more derived, which has lost, um, which has lost the carnivorous habit. And then we have uh, various uh, variations on the theme of carnivorous plants that aren't trapping insects directly uh, or other other animals, but instead that 
uh, are getting their nutrients from other sources, such as Nepenthes lowii, which is coprophagus, um, and then this utricular area, um, Neotoides from Brazil, um, which lacks traffic traps entirely, and all, all of these um, photographs except the, uh, the Drosser Rithoriza are by Andreas Fleischmann. And, so, um, and the book is lavishly illustrated with photographs as well, so all your favorite plants and even some of the seeds um, as well. We also now know a, a lot more about where we find carnivorous plants, and we also know a lot about where we haven't even looked. So, these are the records of carnivorous plants in regional and national herbaria and global biodiversity databases around the world. So there are tens of thousands of herbarium records and collection records of carnivorous plants around the world. And they occur everywhere. Um, and what's notable are these big gaps of places where we don't have any, any herbarium records. And we can ask the questions as to whether these are places where there really are no carnivorous plants, or if these are places where people just haven't gotten to to look for carnivorous plants. Now, I suspect that there are not very many carnivorous plants in the Sahara Desert. Um, but I would expect that there would be some carnivorous plants up in the peatlands in Siberia um, and northern, northern Russia, but I really uh, have no idea, and getting in there to collect uh, could be quite, quite interesting. Larry talked this morning about where carnivorous plants are found, um, and carnivorous plants are found in very bright areas, very wet areas, very nutrient poor areas. In many places, they are places where it burns a lot. Where I live in Massachusetts and where we have our carnivorous plant bogs as we move in New England and further north into Canada and across, um, our carnivorous plant sites are almost entirely peat bogs. Um, uh, mostly ombrotrophic bogs and, and poor fens, very nutrient poor fens, that never burn. All right? It is just much too wet for these habitats to ever burn, but they also have very, woody, very little woody plant cover, um, so it's not like in the pine flatwoods area where the pines will grow up and shade out the carnivorous plants. This is one of my, one of my field study sites. Um, in northwestern Massachusetts, and all of that yellow is Utricularia cornuta um, in, the, in, the mid, in midsummer. And this restriction to bright, nutrient poor habitats was really, I mean, this is something that people who grow carnivorous plants know all the time, have known for a very long time. Um, and evolutionary biologists have been trying to figure out how carnivory would evolve in such a habitat and what would make it beneficial. And Tom Gibnish and his colleagues in the, in the early 1980s put together this basic conceptual model about how carnivory ought to evolve or under what circumstances it could evolve. And they basically made the argument that, that plants benefit from photosynthesis um, and that if plants are in a very nutrient limited environment, the plants will get nutrients from alternative sources like insects and that will contribute nutrients to uh, photosynthetic enzymes and then it will be able to photosynthesis better, photosynthesize better. But that photosynthesis will eventually level off because the photosystems get saturated. These are all what we call C3 plants. Um, so there's a limit to how much of that extra nutrients you can use for photosynthesis. On the other hand, there's a cost to making carnivorous plant traps. And we saw that this morning. So in, in the examples with Drosera, the traps don't photosynthesize as much as the laminas on, on Dionea. Um, and in general, carnivorous plants do not have nearly as high a photosynthetic rate as non-carnivorous um, plants do. Um, and carnivorous traps don't photosynthesize as well as a leaf. So I work with, with, um, with Saracenia, 
And Saracenia, all pitcher plants, the leaves are tubes. And if you imagine a tube photosynthesizing as opposed to a flat leaf photosynthesizing, there's a reason that we don't have solar panels that are cylindrical. Um, and so that's the cost curve here. And so, so if you simply subtract the benefit from the cost, you get the marginal or the net benefit or cost. And Gibnish's idea was that carnivory would be selected for when the benefits, ex the net benefit exceeds the, the net cost, the marginal cost, so in this, in this area here. And he formalized this model and he basically said, well, this would apply differently in sunny and moist habitats. You'd have different costs. The cost curve would always be essentially the same, a cost line, but the benefits curve um, would change depending on whether it was a, a rich site or a poor site in terms of nutrients, a dry site or a sunny site. And so he then, he put this together, he published it in a 1984 paper, and he, he based this model on his studies with Brokinia on the Tapuis in, in Venezuela. And this work was incredibly influential. It, it basically drove a generation of research into the physiology and evolution of carnivorous plants. Now, in 2018, we have much more complicated models. Now we've also got water uh, in this. We've got trade-offs between what the roots are doing and what the shoots are doing. There have been some very intriguing experiments showing that when you, when you feed uh, plants, uh, carnivorous plants, when you feed them extra prey, they start taking up more nutrients through their roots as well. And we don't really understand why this should be the case, but we see it repeatedly. And so now we're incorporating, and, and given this updated his model for, for our book, he, we're incorporating water into this model as well as nutrients and sunlight, roots as well as shoots, um, and all the different things that these, that these plants do. Another area that Juniper rear and colleagues really couldn't anticipate was the explosion of information that we've learned through molecular, molecular work. And, and I'll just give you a couple of, of um, details and, and snippets on, on what, those things, what those things are. Tanya Renner and Vic Alpert and their colleagues have been assiduously doing genome sequencing of a number of carnivorous plants. They published a really interesting paper um, earlier this year um, looking at Utricularia and Cephalotis. And one of the key things that they, that they find is that in these completely disparate groups of carnivorous plants that are all over the plant kingdom, it's the same sets of enzymes over and over and over again that get co-opted from defensive compounds um, to carnivorous digestive compounds. So this, even though you have things evolving in completely different places, they're using the same mechanisms. And evolution just keeps running this in exactly the same way uh, every time. And that's been incredibly uh, that was, is just incredibly unexpected, right? That this is such a common, common um, evolutionary pathway. Carnivorous plants also evolve very rapidly, right? And so the area, the pieces of the, of the carnivorous plant genome that are changing and substituting are going faster in, in carnivorous species like Genlissia and Utricularia and Pigwicula than in any other plant lineage. And so why they have been studied. And so why carnivorous plants evolve so fast um, and how this contributes to their evolutionary diversification um, is something that, that we're still trying to understand uh, exactly um, what, this, what this causes. But we suspect that at least in some species it's related to um, DNA damage that occurs um, when you have reactive oxygen and these rapid metabolic reactions to get, to get uh, prey digested very quickly. Um, and the fact that you have this continuous repeated evolution of trapping genes derived from, from defensive compounds. Another real big change that's occurred in the last 30 years with carnivorous plant research is that we've moved out of the laboratory and into the field. 
And so a very large number of studies are now being done in the field in situ. Um, this is, uh, I don't think you're gonna get quite this far up north um, on your field trip this week. This is, a, this is a photograph from some work I did up in the Siskiyou Mountains in Southern uh, Oregon uh, about 10 years ago after one of the big fires ripped through uh, up there. Um, and, uh, but throughout carnivorous plant uh, research now, we've, reckoned, we've sort of pushed the limits on a lot of the laboratory studies. There's still a lot to learn, as we've, we've seen earlier today. But we're trying to understand how these things work in the field as well. Um, and the other piece that we're working on really assiduously is translating the interesting sort of basic research that we get from just studying the plants that, that we love and translating that information into things that, that other people will find uh, useful. Because a lot of the work that we do, it's scientifically very interesting and a lot of it is paid for by taxpayers and, and both uh, federal grants and private sector grants. Um, and they want some return for their investment that is more than just describing more carnivorous plant species. Um, one example of this is in all the sticky trap things. So these are, uh, these are uh, Drasser and Biblis here and, and, uh, and some pinguiculas. And I, I just I, I like this one because uh, I was visiting this bog in Maine uh, a few summers back. And there, it, was, it was a day when all the dragonflies were really flying. And even though the dragonflies won't fit in the Saracenia, um, once a, a dress or opinions a dragonfly, they will digest eventually that dragonfly. It just takes a few pieces. But these sticky traps um, have generated a whole bunch of new adhesives that people are, are developing to come up with, with sticky compounds that we can use in novel kinds of glues for, for commercial applications. <coughs> Pitcher plants are also getting a lot of attention. Ulrika Bauer, who's, who's here this week, has spent uh, a lot of time trying to understand how pitcher plants work and how they capture, they capture, um, they capture prey using wettable surfaces and non-stick surfaces, so the sort of opposite of the sticky traps. Um, and these ideas have also been uh, developed into uh, technology that uh, this one is called slippery liquid infused porous surfaces or slips. And the idea here is that you use the same kind of friction free um, compounds that, that derive uh, from the ideas of how cells are oriented in the penthes to make for better, essentially, it's like Teflon, non stick coatings. Um, and I would add, since, since Larry pointed out the, uh, the value of, of knowing your history when you study carnivorous plants, um, there's a paper published in the 1820s by a guy named Larry McBride um, who was studying Saracenia flava in North Carolina who had no microscope and was watching the flies slip off the the lip of the pitchers. And he wrote in his paper, he said, this is the most frictionless surface that he'd ever seen. And he said, then, then he goes on to say, and a, I would hope a good microscope could confirm this. Right? And so 100, and 100 plus years later, you know, we finally have actually 100, more than almost 200 years later, we finally have good evidence of this. Other examples of translational research. Um, this is uh, the Venus flytrap, of course, and, and one of the really interesting things about Venus flytrap is after that little electrical signal signals it to, to trap and to close is the, the mechanism of that actual closure. And it does it very cleverly because it uses, it uses um, hydrostatic, so you basically have a, a fluid-filled sac that just works with hydraulic energy to close. And it goes through what we call a phase transition or a, a, a fold bifurcation, also called a tipping point in, in more uh, common parlance where you go from one state where it's, the lobes are open like this 
very rapidly it goes to a closed state where the, the lobes flip from being, I don't know, concave to convex. No, convex to concave. And it does this really, really fast, right? It does this in milliseconds. Well, another group has taken this idea and they've said, well, if we can do this concave to convex transition with a hydrostatic membrane, we ought to be able to do this with an artificial membrane, right? And so the idea then is to do this um, with, a, with essentially a small hemispherical lens that you then apply a current to, an electrical stimulus to it, and it flips in the exact same way as a venous flytrap lobe from concave to convex. And if you use this in microscopy, you basically shift your focal plane immediately and your, your way, your, the, the degree of focus that you have without having to move the microscope up and down. All right, and so this is another uh, application of carnivorous plant research. The last application um, that, I'll, that I'll talk about comes from some of my own work, and I work um, also on, on tipping points of, a, of another, another sort. I'm particularly interested in the transition uh, from clear lakes to oligotrophic lakes, so, so nice, happy blue fish full, lakes full of fish to very polluted lakes that have no fish. Um, that are caused by high nutrient addition. And then the management implications of, of being able to predict this and trying to stop it and then trying to get it back. And this is a, a generic problem in most aquatic systems, um, it, things like lakes, things like the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, generally trying to understand tipping points from one system to another system, and from eco ecological points of view, we're interested in preventing those kinds of tipping points. But this builds up slowly over time, and then all of a sudden it switches, and then it takes decades for this to, to switch back. And it's really hard to study this with lakes. Lakes are big. It's hard to get replicate lakes on your landscape that you can do experiments with. But there are a lot of replicate lakes in Saracenia purpurea. And so this is one of my field sites in, in southern Vermont. Um, and this is a square meter of Saracenia purpurea. And we can imagine that if you feed your pitcher plants a few more ants or a few more wasps than they might see otherwise, that the nice sort of Swedish smelling pitcher fluid would all of a sudden get pretty gross if you give them too much prey. You know, a little too much hamburger, but certainly a little too much flies. And this would either go nice and slowly and linearly, in which case if you stopped feeding them, they'd move back up, or it could go relatively quickly, but still be reversible, sort of like putting your foot on the accelerator and it speeds up really fast and then you let go when it slows down. Or it could be a phase transition, like the lens uh, the, the artificial lens or the venous flytrap, where once it, once it shifts into the, the nutrient-rich or eutrophic state, then it's hard to switch it back, like a lake that goes from blue to green. And in fact, this is what we see in pitcher plants, that if you give them a lot of extra prey, they switch and then it's hard to get them back. The difference is, two differences with pitcher plants. The first is we have a lot of lakes that we can do experiments on. And the second is that unlike lakes with fish that take years to make this switch, with pitcher plants, with Saracenia purpurea, you have bacteria and a small little food web in there, but the bacteria are really doing the work and you can make them switch in about three days because the bacteria are turning over really, really quickly. And then it maybe takes 10 days for it to work backwards, but that's like the equivalent of 100 people years or 100 lake years. So we can study these phase transitions in a lake. We can study in real time with a pitcher plant. And we've been doing this um, using molecular, molecular tools where we basically enrich the pitcher plant or use our controls, 
we grab our samples every two hours, we walk them across the hall or drive them back from the bog to the, the molecular lab. We run the, the genomes and the proteomes in real time to get the, the changes in the, in the bacteria. We can see that there are, in fact, differences in the kinds of bacteria that we get in healthy pitchers or oligotrophic pitchers and eutrophic, uh, heavily uh, loaded pitchers. And we can use this to develop biological indicators that we can apply to lakes because it's the same sets of bacteria in lakes that we have in pitcher plants. We can develop indicators to say how quickly is this uh, going to happen and coming up in a lake so maybe we can then develop um, methods to forestall those kinds of tipping points in lakes as well. Saracenia purpurea has other wonderful attributes. Um, many of you who have seen Saracenia purpurea in the field know that inside of those pitchers, in addition to the bacteria, there's this whole little food web. There are mosquito larvae, there are midge larvae, there are fly larvae that live their entire lives in the pitcher and help the pitcher um, digest and break, break down the prey that, so that it can be subsequently digested and taken up by the plant. Again, we can use these little micro food webs as a model system for what happens when you take a predator out of a system. So what happens when you take that big fly larva out, those mosquito larvae out? It's just like taking the big fish out of the ocean, right? You fish right now in the ocean with what we call fishing down the food chain. So we've eaten all the big fish. Now we're eating the medium-sized fish, and what's going to happen in the future? We're just going to eat the little fish. Well, we only got one ocean, really, to experiment with, and we don't really want to do this experiment. But we can do this experiment with pitcher plants, right? And because our pitcher plants um, throughout North America, this is the Saracenia purpurea complex, the distribution of the Saracenia purpurea complex that Larry described um, this morning. Um, and the gray area is where we find this. And so a crew of us um, sampled Saracenia purpurea throughout this range. Um, and we sampled this food web um, inside uh, the pitcher plant. And the first thing is, is that it's a fairly complicated food web. It's a lot more complicated than many of the food webs that we find on land where we've hunted down all the big predators and the mesopredators. But it's about the same degree of complexity um, as the kinds of food webs that we, we still have in aquatic systems and in the ocean. But the other thing that's interesting, the, the, the black here, the shading, is the degree of similarity among these food webs. So when the black ones are, are basically the same. And so as you go throughout the range of Saracenia from the Gulf Coast up to Newfoundland and Labrador over to British Columbia, you always find the same food web. Not the same genera, the same species. And this is really unique among ecological systems, that we can go across 30 degrees of latitude and 40 degrees of longitude and be working with the exact same set of species. So we can look at how, this, how these um, systems respond to changes in their habitat, to changes in climate, and know that the changes that we're seeing are because of changes in habitat or climate, not because it's a different set of species. And this is not just in Saracenia, but it's in the Penthes as well. And so we now have a lot more information about the Nepenthes food web as well. Again, since Juniper's book came out, Robert Kitching wrote a book on Nepenthes and container habitats. And Leonora Biddleston brings this up to date in her chapter in the, in the carnivorous plant book. So we have a lot of model systems now for studying food webs um, with carnivorous plants where the results are generalizable to a wide range of, of systems. So let me finish up by talking about the future of carnivorous plants and what we can look forward to in the future. And again, this is something that's really different with, with our book from the previous book. So in 1989, we really weren't thinking about 
conservation of carnivorous plants, at least not in a big way. Conservation of carnivorous plants got two lines in Juniper's book. Every chapter in our book talks at some length about the problems of carnivorous plants disappearing, um, whether it's from poaching, uh, habitat destruction, and an entire chapter devoted to what's going to happen with them under climate change scenarios. This has been a warm summer. Those of you visiting from um, Europe and Japan know that it's been a really warm summer. The last 140 months, which is 12 years almost, Every month has been warmer than normal, where normal is defined as the 1950 to 1980 average by the World Meteorological Organization. The average global temperature deviation from that, what we call normal, has gone up very dramatically since the 1970s. This is a meeting about plants, not politics. It's not important what's causing this, whether it's people or not people. The point is, is that it's happening, and it's a very, very visible trend. And the species that we love are affected by this. And I'll give you two examples here. Um, Matt Fitzpatrick and I compiled uh, as much data as we could for carnivorous plants from around the world and did these kinds of, of maps um, and data for dozens of species of carnivorous plants. But this is based two um, quite interesting examples. So this is Saracenia flava, um, and this is Cephalotus follicularis. Um, and the dots are where they occur right now. Um, the, records from either people collecting or in herbaria or in global biodiversity databases. The red are areas where it's predicted to lose habitat suitability simply because of climate change, not because of people going in and building roads or whatever. That's already a, a major threat. But just be where the climate will no longer be suitable. It will just be too hot or too dry. And then the blue is where it would be climatically suitable for those species 80 years from now. Cephalotus is in what we call really deep yogurt. Right? There's where it is. Its entire range is going to be outside of habitat suitability in the next 80 years. And where it would, could be climatically suitable just in terms of temperature and precipitation is a long way north. There's a lot of other stuff there that's in the way. And the same applies for Saracenia flava. It's not in nearly as bad shape except in the far southeast where it's likely to just get too hot and too dry. Um, but very nicely, you know, Saracenia flava could find suitable habitat all the way up into northern Nova Scotia and Quebec. And this is not quite as far-fetched as it seems. I get calls every year from our local chapter of the Nature Conservancy saying, hey, someone put Saracenia flava in our bog in Massachusetts. What should we do with it? And I'm like, you yeah, know, do you want it there? Do you want it out of there? And they usually want it out of there, and then they send it to me. Um, but. But they, they do, you know, it's like because people, you know, you, the plant has to go dormant in the winter and people don't know what to do with it. So they say, well, maybe if I take it to the bog and I put it there next to the boardwalk, I can go get it again next spring. <laughs> and sometimes they forget and sometimes they don't. But as a result of this, these, these, these uh, activities, as well as other well-meaning activities, um, we have Saracenia all over the world. And for those of you from Europe or visit Europe, Saracenia purpurea is considered an invasive species of management concern throughout Europe. So there are populations in Ireland and Switzerland where Saracenia purpurea is growing so vigorously that it's outcompeting everything else in the bogs in which they've planted them, which is great for it, but 
really, you know, we grouse about invasive species here. Let me finish up by talking about what people are doing. I mean, this is great to see, right? This is a big audience. It's a lot bigger than it might have been 40 years ago. Um, there are lots of people out in the world paying attention to carnivorous plants who we can engage in this as well. Throughout, certainly throughout the United States, um, all the natural heritage programs and all the states engage volunteers to do uh, censuses and be eyes on the ground to keep track of how plants are doing. This is just one example um, from the state of Illinois about where Saracenia purpurea is, uh, is state listed. Um, and this is a volunteer program to go, to go look at it. People are using um, carnivorous plants in classrooms, developing lesson plans to, uh, and experimental packets to introduce people to the pleasures of carnivorous plants. Um, my research on carnivorous plants and tipping points have been adopted into the UK uh, curriculum, but that is just one of many, many examples that you can just type in pitcher plants or carnivorous plants and lesson plans. And if you're in a classroom or your kids are in classrooms and you want to use these, they're, they're great, um, great things to work on. And there's, of course, you know, Little Shop of Horrors, and we laugh about Little Shop of Horrors, but it is maybe the most performed stage show in high schools in the United States. It is. It is. There you go. It overtook our town uh, back in the 90s. So, you know, everybody knows, but, but really, I mean, the, the, who remembers, every, and this is a, such a good group, right? Who remembers what Audrey Jr. is a hybrid of? And a Venus flytrap, right? So has anyone actually tried to hybridize a pingricula <laughs> and a dionea, right? But people really, people really get into this. And, and the other thing, right? You know, many of you would have would have uh, heard of the 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 big drosera that was discovered on Facebook a few years back now. And so, you know, people are really looking at these things, and it's really great that people are getting out in the field and looking at them. So, you know, I hope that gives you a, at least a start of a flavor to the, the kinds of things that we know and the kinds of things that we don't know. Um, and uh, I'll encourage, you know, eight lucky persons of you who want to pick up the book in the next hour or so to come by the, the ICPS table in the next door and pick up a copy and I'll happily sign it for you. Um, and then I'm afraid I've got to get on an airplane tonight because I'm leading a field trip to this site tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, which is in southern Mississippi. Um, so I've got to go do that. But uh, thanks very much for listening, and we'll take some questions. Or you can all take a bathroom break, or you can get, you know, run to get a book.